So in chapter 12 here, uh, we're going to talk about uh, chemical bonding and talk about different types of chemical bonding. Uh, we're talking about ionic uh, bonding. Uh, we'll talk about covalent bonding. Uh, we'll also talk about how electrons are either transferred or shared as a result of each of those types. Uh, we will talk about drawing Lewis structures for both ionic compounds and also covalent compounds. And we'll finish up, I think, Jeff, to talk about some geometry of those molecules that we draw and of each of them. So let's get into it. First off, the way that we oftentimes will represent uh, bonding in chemistry is to use with some as Lewis dot symbols. Uh, They're also sometimes just more generically called uh, electron dot symbols. just kind of generically call electron dot symbols. And when we do have a bond uh, that forms, really the only things that are involved are electrons. And there are certain type of electrons which are the outer electrons. And those are what are referred to as the valence electrons. So the valence electrons, as you'll see in 11, if you watched it, uh, are the highest energy electrons. They're the ones that are furthest away from the nucleus, which means they're not as held as tightly. And they either will be transferred or will be shared between two atoms. So you can kind of visualize the two atoms come together since the electrons are on the outside flying around. That is really what comes in contact with one another. Now, when we talk about valence electrons, there's really a couple of different ways that you could figure it out. Uh, really, the simplest way to figure out how many valence electrons an element has is really just to go to the periodic table. Uh, so the group number equals the number of valence electrons that everybody has. So everybody in group one has one valence electron. Everybody in group two has two. Everybody in group three, four, five, six, seven, and eight all have the respected numbers of valence electrons. So that is probably the easiest way to figure out valence electrons, especially when you're doing bonding. Uh, you don't usually want to write your electron configuration to figure it out. You just really want to go to the periodic table and whatever group it is in, uh, that will be how many number of valence electrons that it had. The other way is you can write the electron configuration. So if we wrote some type of electron configuration, like we talked about in chapters 11, something like 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, uh, these numbers here, the one, the two, and stuff, those are the principal quantum number, which is really the energy levels. And obviously, two is larger than one. The numbers up on top are the numbers of electrons. So for this particular guy, two electrons in that orbital and four electrons in those shells are basically the valence electrons for a total of six. Uh, that is, by the way, if we go to the periodic table, that is oxygen's electron configuration, and oxygen is sitting right there in group six, so it has six valence electrons. So that's probably the easiest way to figure out valence electrons, equaling the group number. You could also, uh, again, get it from um, <clears throat> the electron configuration. When we look at electron configuration like 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, once again, uh, these would be the valence electrons. The electrons lower in energy are also sometimes referred to as core electrons. And core electrons, because they are lower in energy, they're closer to the nucleus, they're held really tightly, which means that they are not involved in bonding. So when we talk about bonding in this chapter, when we draw sort of Lewis structures and, and those type of things, it is only the valence electrons that are shown. Uh, these elements do have other electrons, which are those core electrons that are not involved in bonding, but we do only show those valence electrons. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. So Lewis dot symbols are really just that. It, uh, to draw a Lewis dot symbol, we really just use the actual symbol for the element. And we do use just really one dot to represent each of the valence electrons 
uh, that that particular element has. Now, there's no real sort of rule per se in terms of how you go about doing that. Um, the main rule is if we use our symbol, the main rule is really no more than two dots per side. And that means that if you really do sort of fill up the symbol, we have two dots per side, four sides, that is eight electrons. Yeah, so eight electrons is sort of where it maxes out at. And if we think about the periodic table and who has eight valence electrons, that is group eight on the periodic table, which are the noble gases. And really the whole point of all bonding, be it ionic bonding that we'll talk about or covalent bonding that we'll also talk about, really the whole point of that process is for all the elements basically to achieve the same electron configuration as a noble gas, which is everybody in group eight. So really the goal of everybody is to achieve that noble gas configuration, that group eight. Um, that is basically what everybody is shooting for. And that's really why bonding occurs. So here are some Lewis dot symbols for each of the elements. Again, you can see everybody here in group one has one. Everybody in two, obviously three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. A couple of things that you might notice is uh, helium here. Helium here only has two dots and it only has two valence electrons. And that's because helium is element number two, which means it only has two electrons total. So it can't have eight. So even though it's part of group eight, it needs only two. Uh, and that is also why, as we'll talk about, a really important thing in bonding and a thing that people screw up all the time is hydrogen. In order for hydrogen to be happy, it actually only needs to get to helium in terms of its configuration, which means hydrogen should never ever have any more than basically two electrons. So hydrogen should only max out at two. If you find yourself at any point during this chapter or on a quiz or an exam, putting lots and lots of dots and lines to hydrogen, you should probably just put an X through it because it definitely is going to be wrong. So hydrogen, only needs to have a total of two and only should have two to get to helium. Yes, sir. The good news is uh, it does vary um, in terms of how many electrons they have. Uh, in terms of valence electrons, most people consider them to have like two valence electrons because they do lose the S's first, uh, but they could have more because then they go into the D's. The good news is we will not do any type of uh, bonding that involves transition metals or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about uh, drawing any of those pictures because they're not necessarily as straightforward. Uh, as we'll talk about, basically, uh, the sort of representative metals will come back to the noble gas configurations. But really, when uh, transition metals loses electrons, they really don't do that same sort of process. They don't really usually end up at a noble gas configuration. So we really won't come across those at all in this class or pretty much any of your classes that you would take. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. You could actually draw, like I said, you really, you could draw them. Yeah. Most people, most people, a lot of times will just kind of do one at a time and then come back and pair. There's really no real rule. Don't do two on the side. So in this case, you could draw it like that, or, you know, you could draw it like some of the ones over here with the opposite side. So as long as you don't go more than two, you're good. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? So let's talk a little about really the two sort of big categories of bonding. And we're gonna get into each of these in more specifics as we go through it. But the one type of bonding uh, that occurs is what's referred to as ionic bonding. Uh, and ionic bonding or ionic compounds are always between a metal and a non-metal. And what happens because it is always between a metal and non-metal and some of those periodic trends that were talked about at the end of chapter 11, uh, what happens is metals have a lot of properties like ionization energy, which is the energy needed to remove an electron. It has low electron affinity, which means it doesn't really like to gain electrons. And it has low electronegativity, which means it doesn't want to attract electrons. So all those periodic trends that metals have 
they typically will be the ones that will lose electrons. So what happens when a metal gets together with a non-metal, which has basically the opposite sort of periodic trends, top right of the periodic table, you got everybody that is smaller. They have very high electronegativity, which means they like to bring electrons to themselves. They have high electron affinity, which means they like to gain electrons. And they have very high ionization energy, which means it takes a lot of energy to remove electrons. So what nonmetals really like to do is pretty much gather electrons and gain electrons. Metals typically are the ones that will lose electrons. So when these two guys get together, because of the big differences in their periodic trends, what happens is metals will basically transfer electrons to our nonmetals. The result of that is the metal will become a cation that's positively charged. The nonmetal will become an anion, which is negatively charged. And one really important aspect of ionic bonding to understand is there is absolutely no sharing of electrons that occurs in ionic bond. So we have a complete transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. And what holds that together is what's referred to as electrostatic attraction, basically opposites attract. So the positive charge and the negative charge of the two ions with no sharing of electrons that occur. That is one of the strongest sort of attractions you could have, that positive negative attraction that occurs. It actually gets stronger with charge. So something like plus three and minus three will be held together a lot stronger than something that has like a plus one and minus one sort of charge. Now, that's very different than what happens when we put together a covalent compound. Covalent compounds basically involve two nonmetals. And because when we look at the periodic table where our nonmetals are, they are all pretty much sitting in the same area of the periodic table, which means that they all have pretty much the same periodic trends. Pretty much all nonmetals have high ionization energy. They have high electronegativity and they have high electron affinity. And what that all means, as I just mentioned, is nonmetals like to gain electrons and hang on to their own electrons. So when two nonmetals come together, what happens is they both pretty much want to hang on to their electrons. So nobody's going to give up their electrons pretty easily. So the best thing that happens and the best sort of compromise that will happen is there'll be some sharing of electrons that will occur between two nonmetals. They'll go, well, I'm not giving mine up. You're not giving yours up. We'll just kind of share the electrons between them. So there's some aspect of sharing that occurs of electrons in a covalent compound. And as we will talk about later in this chapter, that sharing, again, may be equally equal sharing or unequal sharing, depending on the type of bond. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So we could use Lewis dot symbols to help us understand sort of what is happening when we have the different types of bonding that's occurring. So let's take a look at that, I think. So generally speaking, everybody in group one and two are typically the ones we would expect to lose electrons. Uh, those on the top right of the periodic table, again, are the ones that we expect to gain electrons. Based on the periodic trends, those in chapter 11, uh, you know, the most reactive nonmetals are found really upper right of the periodic table. The most reactive metals are found lower left of the periodic table. Might answer some post lab questions today. That's where you'll find those um, guys that are most reactive because of those periodic trends. So let's take a look at lithium fluoride. So we know lithium is a metal. And fluorine is a nonmetal, so we basically have a metal and a nonmetal together. Now, pretty much as soon as you're able to recognize that those two elements are a metal and a nonmetal together, that's all you need to know. This 100% of the time will be an ionic compound. So just by that, it's a metal and a nonmetal together. We know we're going to have an ionic compound. We know we're going to have a transfer of electrons as well. So those are the things that you will know for sure. If we look at lithium, lithium is group number one, which means it has one valence electron. We know that also from the electron configuration for chapter 11 would be like 1s2, 2s1. 
the one valence electron is that guy right there in the box that got on top. This guy would be the core electrons. Those two right there would be that guy's core electrons. With fluorine, fluorine is group seven, which means it should have seven valence electrons. So let's look something like this. If you wrote up the electron configuration for fluorine, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5 in this case. Once again, these are both on the second energy level, which means it's higher than everybody else. And that would be the seven valence electrons that fluorine has. So those are the orbitals. Again, check some stuff here. Those are the orbitals uh, where those electrons are held. So what's going to happen because of this difference in electronegativity values and really periodic trends is the lithium is going to go, go ahead, you could have my electron. And the fluorine is going to go, thank you very much, actual conversation. And the fluorine is going to pick up that electron there because it wants to. And the lithium is not going to really fight it because it's willing to give up its electrons. The result of that is when that occurs, our lithium has now lost an electron and will become positively charged. Our fluorine here will have picked up that one electron. And because it picked up the one electron, it has an extra electron and will become negatively one charge. Now, because this is an ionic compound, when we draw our Lewis dot symbols like we're doing here, we need to include the charge to indicate that there is no electrons being shared, that these are ions. We've had a transfer of electrons that occur. I would say most people pretty much put a kind of bracket around at least one of them, like I did there with the negative charge guy. So I'm open brackets around both, but you need at least minimum have the charges uh, when you draw these things that are ionic. Do you have a question? Yeah. No, uh, so there are some that have more than, uh, so for example, the lithium there has two electrons that are in this core and uh, same thing with fluorine. As you go further down, there's more core electrons than, the S, uh, again, is uh, from chapter 11. So that's the orbital at where the electrons are being held. So that is, electrons are held in different orbitals, S, P, D, and F. So that's kind of where in the atom, it's the, basically those electrons were held. The numbers, like the one, the two, and all that is basically the different energy levels. The higher the number, the further away it is from the nucleus. And stuff like that. Other questions? <clears throat> Now, if we do look at the electron configuration, what basically happened with lithium is it lost that electron and it ends up with only two electrons at this point, which is a configuration of 1s2. And on the periodic table, number two is what element? It is helium, which is a noble gas. So by lithium giving away its electron, what it's able to do is basically back up on the periodic table to the noble gas that came right before it. And again, that is, as we've been talking about, really the goal of bonding is for everybody. And just so we're clear, they're not changing into the noble gas. They're basically having the same number of electrons as the noble gas has. Because in order for them to change elements, we would have to change protons, which is not happening here. So they're just getting the same type of electrons that those noble gases have to make them stable. They're still lithium and that type of stuff. So the element doesn't change. That electron, again, really does travel over here to this orbital uh, in the fluorine where it has room for it. And it actually gains an electron, ends up with a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 configuration. And if you want to know how many electrons, we count the top numbers, 2, 4, and 6 more is 10 electrons. And again, if you look at the periodic table, number 10 is neon's configuration. So both of the elements here in this bond were able to achieve noble gas configuration. The metal is able to achieve it by giving away its electrons, which moves it on the periodic table backwards to the noble gas that comes before it. And what happens with our nonmetals are they're able to accept those electrons that were lost by the metal, and the nonmetals will then go forward on the periodic table and then has the same electron configuration as that element that comes right after them. 
So again, if you look on the periodic table there, neon's right after fluorine, and that is the noble gas that it ends up being. <clears throat> Any questions on that one? So once again here, no electrons being shared, complete transfer of electrons. The opposite charge, that electrostatic attraction, is really what is holding that together. I just should say that right about here, I think. And that is what is referred to as an ionic bond. The negative attraction between the two ions, again, does get stronger with charge. <clears throat> so whenever you have any combination of a metal and non-metal that comes together, that is pretty much what is going to happen. The metal will lose one, two, however many electrons it needs to lose to back itself up there to the noble gases and the non-metal will gain those. <clears throat> now, the one exception was sort of a question that was earlier about the transition metals. Uh, transition metals, when they lose electrons, they don't end up that noble gas configuration like the represented ones in group two and three. Uh, and again, the good news is we don't really deal with those in terms of bonding, so you don't really have to worry about those guys. Let's take a look at another example, which is calcium. So if we look at the periodic table, calcium is group number two which means it has two valence electrons. And if we write the electron configuration for calcium, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and 4s2. So those are the two valence electrons. And to answer, I think your question a second ago, all the ones below that would be considered the core electrons, yeah? Uh, that were closer to the nucleus, not involved in bonding and stuff like that. So those two electrons would be the valence electrons for calcium. We'll put it together with oxygen, which is group six, which means it should have six valence electrons. And if we write the electron configuration for oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And once again, for oxygen, that is the six electrons that are the valence electrons for oxygen that we see in the picture. And its core electrons would be obviously the ones outside the box there at the lower energy level. So the same situation is going to occur here. We have a metal, which is calcium. We have a non-metal, which is oxygen. So right off the bat, we know it's going to be ionic. We know that the metal is going to transfer its electrons to the non-metal. So what's going to happen here is our calcium is going to lay up its electrons over here and it will take both of them here and that's okay right because the oxygen has really room for two of them because it only has six electrons at this point at this point when calcium does that it now will become calcium that has a plus two charge as it has lost two electrons our oxygen there will gain the two electrons that it gave and end up with all those electrons and a negative two charge. Once again, if we look at what's sort of occurring with the electron configuration, our calcium gave up these two electrons here, which leaves the calcium with a plus two charge of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And again, if you add up the top numbers on all that, that is 18. And that is the same electron configuration as argon. So here, calcium needed to lose two electrons to make its way back to the same electron configuration as argon, which is the noble gas that comes right before it. Once again, those two electrons here will end up over here in these orbitals. Uh, on the oxygen because it has room for it. And that would then turn our oxygen with a minus two charge or our oxide as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And that again, counting the top number is 10, which means our oxygen has now achieved neon's electron configuration. So once again, here in this ionic compound, our metal has lost its electrons which allows the metal to back up to the noble gas that comes before it and be very happy in that situation. And our non-metal gains the electrons and goes forward and will now end up with the same electron configuration as 
the noble gas that comes after it. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So what would happen if we perhaps combo those two guys here? We took uh, the metal here and we maybe we put it together with the fluorine. We'll see how that sort of works out. So let's say we took our calcium, which basically has argon 4s2, which is those two electrons. And let's say we decided to put it together with fluorine that we saw earlier, uh, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. In this particular case, we have the metal, which is our calcium. We have our non-metal, which is our fluorine. And same thing is going to happen, ionic bond. So we're going to transfer our electron over to the fluorine. At this point, will that fluorine be able to accept any more electrons? It will not because now it has eight. That is problematic for calcium because if it only loses one electron on the periodic table, where does it end up in terms of its configuration? It ends up at potassium 19, right? It's because it only lost one electron. And that definitely is not a noble gas. So in this situation, calcium really does need to lose both electrons. And in order to do that, you will actually need not one fluorine, but you will actually need a second fluorine that would be able to accept the second electron. The result of this is we now get our calcium that has lost both of its electrons, which makes it happy. Each of the fluorines actually only gained one electron each, which means each of the fluorines will end up with a minus one charge. Let's draw it over here. And now all three of those elements actually have achieved noble gas configuration. Our calcium, has lost both of these electrons, which allows it to reach argon's configuration at 18. Each of the fluorines put an electron into that spot, into those orbitals, and that gives each of the fluorines 10 electrons and also means that each of these guys achieve neon's configuration. So in this particular case, we needed an extra non-metal to sort of get to take the electron to do so. If you remember what we were lecturing on last week at the end, when we talked about ions, when you take a positive ion and you take a negative ion and you put it together, you want to put it together in the simplest way to end up with a charge that equals zero. So that is why when we take something that is a calcium that has a plus two charge and a fluoride that is minus two, when we put them together, the proper formula is CaF2. And it's really because of the bonding. By doing that and making sure that the charge equals zero, you're basically allowing all those elements to reach noble gas configuration, which is ultimately what they want to do. And the simplest way to do that um, is uh, basically what you need to get to zero. <clears throat> so that is why when we talked about earlier, putting those charges together to equal zero, the real basis behind that is actually the bonding aspect of it. Again, it gets everybody to that noble gas configuration. Any questions on ionic bonding using Lewis symbols or structures here? So a couple of notes, like I mentioned, when you do draw these, you do need to include the charge because they are ions and they are ionic. Um, and again, just remember that there are no trans, there are no sharing of electrons here. Everything's been transferred. And 100% of the time, you will be safe in our, your classes that you take if you see a metal and non-metal coming together to know that it is ionic compound that's happening and you have that transfer of electrons. Any questions on any of that? <clears throat> okay. All right, so the next type of bonding we're going to talk about is actually a little bit different. It is covalent bonding. And covalent bonding occurs between two nonmetals. And as I mentioned earlier, the two nonmetals are essentially in the same spot 
on the periodic table, which means again, they share the same sort of periodic trends. As we talked about, what's going to happen here is some type of sharing of electrons. So no charges going to occur, no ions are going to occur. We're just gonna have sharing of electrons. And as we will talk about that sharing may be equal. So you'll have nice equal sharing of electrons or it may be unequal sharing of electrons, but definitely in a covalent compound or a covalent bond, some aspect of sharing that is happening of those electrons between the two nucleuses. So for example, Lewis discussed the bond as the sharing of electrons. So when we take two hydrogen atoms, each one has one electron uh, because they're both hydrogen and hydrogen is a nonmetal what's going to happen is they're going to decide basically to share those electrons. So what happens is the hydrogen will share the electrons with the other hydrogen. And those two electrons in the middle count for the hydrogen on the left. And they also count for the hydrogen on the right. And by sharing electrons in this case, that allows both of those hydrogens to achieve two electrons. And once again, when we look at the periodic table, number two is helium. And as I mentioned earlier, that's pretty much what hydrogen needs. It just needs to get the helium. So he's able to basically achieve noble gas configuration uh, by just sharing those two electrons. You could draw sort of the sharing of electrons uh, one of two ways uh, with dots like we see there or you could draw the sharing of electrons with a single line, and that represents a single bond. So a lot of times people will show electrons that are being shared between two atoms as a bond uh, with a line. If you like to use lines, you can. I personally use lines most of the time for that, uh, but other people use dots either way, it's, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> one line, again, as we will see in just a bit, is a single bond. That is basically the sharing of two electrons. Two lines is a double bond, which is the sharing of four electrons or two pairs. And a triple bond is three lines, which is the sharing of basically six electrons. And we'll see more of that in just a second. What holds up the electrons there is there is an attractive force between the electrons and the nucleuses of each of those atoms. So those electrons in the middle feels attraction to the nucleus to the left, but also feels some attraction to the nucleus to the right. The result of that is it kind of locks those electrons in the place between the two atoms. And that is really what's going to hold together that sort of covalent bond. So they're kind of attracted one way, but attracted the other way. Kind of like if two people were equally strong on opposite sides of a rope pulled on it equally, rope's pretty much just going to kind of stay there locked into place, right? So that's sort of the idea that happens when we have sharing of electrons. Any question? Yeah. Yeah, so an ion bond is always a transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. It results in ions being formed positive cation for the metal, negative anion for the nonmetal. In a covalent bond, there's absolutely no transfer of electrons. They're just strictly shared between the two atoms. And again, we'll talk about it here in just a second, either equally or unequally, they'll be shared. Other questions? <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, uh, again, that is the, what holds it sort of together is that mutual attraction. Again, a reminder, right? Basically our nucleus is positively charged with the protons in there and our electrons are negatively charged. So again, it's that sort of electrostatic attraction uh, between the electrons and the nucleuses on each side that holds the actual bond together and keeps them basically shared between the two atoms. Another example would be uh, fluorine F2. So if we take fluorine, which is group seven, has seven valence electrons, and we take another fluorine that also has seven valence electrons. Again, electron configuration here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Uh, 
these being the seven valence electrons in each. They're going to come together here and decide to share those electrons. The result of that is here we will form a bond between the two fluorines where those electrons are being shared. So those two electrons in the middle will count for the fluorine on the left, which gives it eight electrons. And the two electrons in the middle there will count for the fluorine on the right, which will also give it eight electrons. And again, if we look at the periodic table, the one that has eight valence electrons is group number eight, which is the noble gases. So again, in this case, by sharing those electrons, it allows both elements in that bond basically to reach noble gas configuration and be stable. Again, the electrons that are being shared between the two fluorines can be represented like that with the dots, or you could represent those electrons that are being shared through a line. And again, both of those are equivalent as that line represents basically two electrons. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Yeah. So the um, non metals we want to reach double gas configuration, all the metals want to reach. Everybody wants to reach it. Everybody wants to reach group eight. Yeah. What's that? Argon is group eight, yeah. It's a noble gas. So helium, neon, argon, krypton, all those guys. Yeah. So all those guys would be group eight. Uh, and helium is also group eight. Again, it only has two because helium has a maximum of only two electrons total. So it doesn't have eight, but it, that's why hydrogen stops at helium. So when we look at these structures, there's a couple of different types of electrons that we see. Uh, so if we look at the fluorine, all the electrons that are dots, these are what are considered non-bonding electrons. That's pretty much what people call it these days. If you're old like me, maybe you call it lone pairs. And if I do, it's the same thing. So I think a lot of books just roll with non-bonding electrons these days, uh, but lone pairs and non-bonding electrons are the same thing. They are electrons that are not involved in a bond, which is hence the name. We know they're not involved in the bond because obviously there's no element written next to them. Uh, there's also another type of electrons that we see in the structure, and that is the one that actually is involved in a bond here. And that's the one between the two fluorines, which is being shared. And it also has a creative name. They are known as bonding electrons. So much like the names imply, bonding electrons are the electrons that are being shared between two atoms. Non-bonding electrons are the ones that usually are represented by dots and are not being shared uh, between any atoms. And there's really no bond that's happening there. When you draw your Lewis structures, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this chapter, how to properly draw them, uh, you should always show all of those. So you always show the non-bonding electrons in your pictures and also the bonding electrons. And in terms of the bonding electrons, again, those are the ones that are typically shown as a line or two lines or three lines, depending. Uh, but again, if you don't want to use lines, you could also use dots for them. Non-bonding electrons are usually always shown as dots, not really lines, unless you find a really old organic teacher. But uh, most people will just use dots for those. So dots for the non-bonding, lines are dots for the bonding in terms of drawing those pictures. So a Lewis structure, again, is a representation of bonding. It helps us really understand, as we saw with ionic bonding, what's going on. It also can help us understand with covalent bonding. And a reminder that again, only really showing in these pictures the valence electrons, which are really the outermost highest energy electrons and the ones that are involved in bonding. Um, but again, they do have other electrons like the core electrons, which are not involved in bonding. <clears throat> so here's a couple more examples. Uh, here we have water. And in this case, water, uh, the oxygen actually needs to share some electrons with both hydrogens to reach eight. 
And what we see with the hydrogen by sharing with the oxygen is each of the hydrogen, again, ends up with two electrons and our oxygen ends up with eight, which is really important. Once again, just to reiterate, this is pretty much how you will see hydrogen written most of the time and how it should be written. You'll never find hydrogen like in the center of a molecule because it would have more than two electrons. So it should really have one line which represents two electrons and that's all you should ever do with hydrogen. If you again find yourself with the urge to do these things, you should do that. My favorite is like triple bonding it and putting the dots. That's like super overkill, that doesn't happen type of thing. So hydrogen, really important. I emphasize that because sometimes people go crazy as they're drawing these things and they just keep like putting dots on everything on lines because it looks more chemistry-like, right? To do all those things. And it's definitely should not happen. <clears throat> So we sort of touched upon it, but officially here, when everybody is trying to reach eight electrons, that is what is known as the octet rule. Octet obviously meaning eight. And again, pretty much what the octet rule says is in a covalent sort of situation, everybody will continue to make bonds until they have eight valence electrons around it. The notable exception is the one obviously we've been talking about, which is hydrogen. Hydrogen, because as we talked about there on the periodic table, only needs to get to helium, uh, will only need two. And again, that is what is referred to as the duet rule sometimes. Hydrogen two, everybody else eight, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? All right. So again, how do we get to the eight? Well, in certain cases, to get everybody to eight, it may just require a single bond. And as we talked about, a single bond represented by the one line represents a pair of electrons, which is two total electrons. And something like F2 is perfectly good, it just needs a single bond. It gets itself to the octet rule. Everybody is happy. In certain cases, a single bond is not enough for a situation to reach the octet rule. And sometimes you do need to make a double bond. And a double bond is represented by, as I mentioned earlier, two lines, which represents two pairs of electrons or four total. So something like CO2, it actually needs to make two double bonds to be happy. So something like CO2, the carbon needs to actually double bond on both sides. And by doing so, the carbon there will end up with eight electrons around it. The oxygen by also double bonding will end up with eight and the oxygen on the left by double bonding will also end up with eight. So in certain situations, it does sometimes require a double bond to sort of fix the problem, if you will, and get everybody to eight. Um, and some cases, the double bond is not enough to get everybody to eight. So sometimes people do need to make a triple bond to allow everybody to get to eight. And again, a triple bond, as we mentioned a second ago, um, is three lines and represents six electrons. So a triple bond represents six total electrons or three pairs of electrons. And nitrogen is an example of that. The nitrogen here on the left needs those six electrons being shared to reach eight. Nitrogen on the right needs the three electrons or pairs to be shared. Uh, this guy here on the bottom, actually the carbon needs that triple bond between the two carbons to get to eight. And once again, here we see that our hydrogen still needs only two electrons. Now, speaking of double bonds, single bond and triple bond, when we talk about the rules for drawing Lewis structures for covalent bonds, it is a common problem that people like to sort of just double bond, triple bond right out of the box, like double bond everything, triple bond everything. Again, I think people think it looks more chemistry-like or something like that. Uh, I would highly recommend that in most cases, usually you wanna kind of single bond everything and then kind of look at it and see, is the octet rule met? And if it's not, that's usually when you want to incorporate 
applying a double bond or a triple bond to the situation to sort of fix a situation where maybe the octet rule has not been met. So just keep that in mind as we further talk in this chapter about drawing these things, you know, you usually just don't want to like double bond and triple bond right out of the box. You want to kind of save that to fix the situation, uh, usually when the octet rule is not met. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so remember like the electrons are, are flying around right in the open space. So as these uh, sort of atoms come together, you know, there's going to be that pop bring the electrons down. Those electrons would then kind of go between them too, if you want to kind of think about it that way, yeah. And it's really that sort of also attraction to the nucleus and both of them, bring those electrons flying around as they come closer to each other, sort of into that kind of heavily positive charge at that point. If you now have two nucleuses coming together, big positive charge and kind of bring the electrons into that area. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So we're talking about here covalent bonding and we're talking about really sharing of electrons. So there is one thing that we typically will use to help us determine really, are the electrons going to be shared equally between the two atoms? Or are they going to be shared unequally between the two atoms? And really the major thing that we look at is electronegativity. So electronegativity, as we will see, and we talked a little bit about it in chapter 11 as well, is the ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself. The general trend of electronegativity on the periodic table is it increases as you go up and right and decreases as you go down. Fluorine is the most electronegative element that we have. And again, it's as far up and right as you can go. Up to the right of fluorine are the noble gases, which are chemically inert. They're perfectly happy the way they are. That's really why everybody's trying to be like them because they're happy. Um, so they really don't react. So far up and right it could go is fluorine. And that is the most electronegative element you could have. Technically speaking, electronegativity for those noble gases is like none, basically, because they really aren't looking to do much uh, because they're happy. So when we look at a bond that's happening and there's sharing of electrons that's occurring, uh, so for example, if we take something like hydrogen and we put it together, to make our bond, those electrons that are being shared, we would expect those electrons between those two guys to basically be shared equally because frankly, they're both the same element. So it is kind of like that tug of war example with the rope, basically you have hydrogen this way pulling on the electrons, exact same hydrogen the other way pulling on electrons. So there's going to be really equal sharing of those electrons. And really the result of that is sort of an equal distribution of electrons over the whole bond. And it kind of makes, if you want to think about it this way, a bond that really is like neutral. There is no like positive side, negative side. It's sort of nice and equally shared. And that type of bond where we have equal sharing of electrons is what is known as a nonpolar covalent bond. I'll be honest with you, most people just lay up, it's a nonpolar bond. They kind of leave the covalent part of it off. So somebody says nonpolar bond, it's the same thing as a nonpolar covalent bond. Um, it's basically equal sharing of electrons. So we definitely see that with the H2 example. We will also see it with the F2 example as well. Once again, we would expect those electrons between the two to be shared equally as both have the same pool on those electrons because they're basically the same element. So you're going to have like the exact same pool in both directions or in opposite directions is going to be equal to each other. Now, what happens if we replace 
a fluorine with a hydrogen and we have a bond between hydrogen and fluorine. Will the electrons be shared equally in this case? The answer is they will not. If we think about one really important thing, which is electronegativity, hydrogen is over there, right? Fluorine is way over there. Fluorine is the most electronegative element you could have. And what that means is it's going to bring electrons towards itself. So it's going to draw those electrons that are being shared towards the fluorine. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a big, if my blue here is like the electrons hanging out on the fluorine side and not so much there on the hydrogen side because of fluorine's ability to bring those electrons to itself. Now, what would happen in this situation if the electrons are hanging out closer to the fluorine side versus the hydrogen side? Would the fluorine side be more positive or more negative? The fluorine side should end up being actually more negative, right? Because the electrons, which are negative, are actually hanging out over there. And the hydrogen side will actually end up being more positive because of that. It's kind of electron deficient as they move away, right? It's kind of like, what happened to my electrons? So what ends up happening is it actually creates what's referred to as a partially negative charge. And that's a delta symbol and a negative and a partially positive charge there on the hydrogen as a result of this unequal sharing of electrons. They are still being shared, but they're in this case, like our tug of war example, a much stronger person on this side pulling than this guy. This guy is just kind of like hanging on for life, right? And is still able to hang on. So there is still sharing of electrons is happening. Another way we can represent this is with an arrow. And the arrow points to the side that's more negative. And so this usually points to the side that's more negative. And kind of the back part of the arrow that makes like a plus sign is usually at the side that's more positive. So in this case, the result of this is unequal sharing of electrons. And that type of bond is what's known as a polar covalent bond. And again, most people will just call it a polar bond. So if somebody says polar bond, it's the same thing as a polar covalent bond. It represents unequal sharing of electrons. Question on that there. <laughs> My question is, why is this a partially negative charge and that's a partially positive charge? Why are they not just like full negatives and full positive charges? There is still some active sharing. A compound where there is no sharing going, on. the electrons transfer from one to the next, where we do get a full positive charge, full negative charge with our ions. In a polar bond, there is still some aspect of sharing that's happening. So we only get the partially positive charge and partially negative charge. Is there a question? Or I got it? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. All right, so that's basically what we just talked about. That is a polar bond, unequal sharing of electrons going to always be, electrons are always going to be going towards the one that is the most electronegative within the bond between the two. And the one that's obviously less electronegative uh, will have the electrons kind of being pulled away from them. But if it is a polar bond or polar covalent bond, because it's covalent, there is, again, still some aspect of sharing uh, that is taking place. There's my smear. <laughs> so to sort of summarize the three different types of bonding that we've talked about here so far, on really one end of the spectrum, we have an ionic bond. And an ionic bond is always between a metal and a non-metal where the metal will transfer electrons, resulting in a cation that is positively charged or anion that is negatively charged. And again, it is that electrostatic attraction that holds that together, no sharing of electrons. <clears throat> 
like our lithium fluoride example that we saw earlier. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a nonpolar covalent bond. And a nonpolar covalent bond is two nonmetals with equal sharing of electrons. And an example like our H2, our F2, those are all examples of it. And sort of in the middle, we have a polar covalent bond or just a polar bond. Also between two nonmetals, also sharing of electrons, but unequal sharing. And the example there is our HF, where we will end up with that partially positive side and partially negative side. So one end ionic, complete transfer of electrons, other end perfect sharing of electrons. And in the middle, not so much difference that the electrons get transferred, but not so much similarity if they're shared equally. So really in between where we have unequal sharing of electrons. Any questions on any of those three types of bonding? Yeah. And obviously the two on the right are uh, always between two nonmetals. Anything covalent should be two nonmetals. And the guy on the left there, anything that's ionic is always a metal and a nonmetal. So it's a good way to just quickly recognize what you're dealing with. If you come across a bond, you want to identify, you know, are these things metals and nonmetals, just nonmetals happening here. And that will tell you whether or not you're dealing ionic bonding or covalent bonding that's happening. So now that we sort of have an idea of the differences in terms of how the bonds happen or how they are, how do we know when we especially get into a covalent bonding situation, you know, will they be shared equally or will they be shared unequally? What we're going to talk about will also help you with ionic bonding. But once again, uh, you really don't need any other help other than that's a metal and nonmetal to know it's ionic. That's pretty much all you need uh, to help you out with that. So it is the electronegativity, which is that ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself. That is really what we look at when we are trying to determine how the electrons are going to be shared between two atoms. Are we going to get that equal sharing? We're going to get that unequal sharing. And electronegativity is really based off of those other periodic trends, the ionization energy, uh, which is the energy needed to remove an electron, and the electron affinity, affinity, which is the energy change when an electron is gained by an atom. And something like fluorine, as we talked about, has high electron affinity, which means it likes to gain electrons, high ionization energy, which means it's a very difficult time to make it lose electrons. So once again, it always wants to kind of gain electrons or nonmetals. And our metals like sodium have the opposite sort of effect. It has a low electron affinity, which means it's not really looking to get electrons. And it has a low ionization energy, which means you don't have to do much to convince it to lose its electrons. So it doesn't take a lot of energy to allow it to lose electrons. <clears throat> so fluorine would have high electronegativity and sodium would have low electronegativity because of that. Now, a guy by the name of Pauling actually came up with a chart uh, that measures electronegativity values. And the Pauling chart goes from zero to four. Four is the most electronegative. And zero, not so much. So zero is pretty low in electronegativity, pretty much a none. That is kind of like your noble gases. They got like zeros. It's like, I'm good. I don't really care about your electrons. So we could use the differences in electronegativity values if you have that table to help you decide whether or not you will end up with a, or should end up with a polar bond, a nonpolar bond, or an ionic bond. <clears throat> and we calculate what is sometimes referred to as the change in electronegativity values. So that delta En is a change in electronegativity. Uh, 
And if you calculate the change in electronegativity, and it's pretty simple to do, you just subtract the two numbers. So you just subtract the two numbers to get a positive number. And if you get anywhere between 0 to 0 0.4, that is considered a nonpolar bond, which means we would expect equal sharing of electrons to occur. If you do the differences between the two values and you get anywhere from like above 0 0.4, which I guess is 0 0.5, right? basically 0 0.5, to below two, that is a polar bond, which means that you would expect the electrons to be shared unequally as a result of it. Typically anything above two, which doesn't work perfectly in all cases, that is an ionic bond, which you should have a transfer of electron. So I'm gonna be truthfully honest with you, electronegativity values, as I mentioned, you don't even need them for ionic. Metal, non-metal, ionic, just write it down, move on with your life, you'll be good. Uh, you should be fine in pretty much all cases. So really we could use our differences in electronegativity values to help us understand between really two non-metals, you know, what type of bond we would expect. So this chart here, which follows the general trend of up and to the right is most electronegative and down to the left is the least electronegative helps us do that. So if we take a look at our examples that we saw earlier, we had LIF, uh, we had HF, and we had F2, right? So if we were going to use this table, we would look at the electronegativity value for fluorine, which is four. And that would be, this guy would have a value of four. This guy would have a value of four, which means the change in electronegativity would be four minus four, which would equal zero. So that definitely is between zero and 0.4, which means we would expect this to be, as we talked about, a nonpolar bond. <clears throat> By the way, if you do get a difference that is like a difference of zero, like we just got there, it is a nonpolar bond, but sometimes people will call that a pure covalent bond, like is perfect equal sharing of electrons. So if you see somebody say pure covalent bond, it is a nonpolar bond and it is equal sharing of electrons. Yeah. It's like anything else. They said something is sort of like a standard value and sort of do some measurements. And, you know, it's only like, you know, 5% of what that guy is and stuff like that. So uh, that would be similar to how uh, they would find something like that. They would sort of arbitrarily, a lot of times in chemistry, what they'll do for something is just arbitrarily give it a value like four, for example, and go, okay, this guy, you know, in terms of electrons and gaining electrons ability, you know, it's only so much percentage of say fluorine. And so it's, you know, that type of number. All right. So if we do it for our other guys here, which is hydrogen on the left there, which is 2.1, fluorine being four, differences in electronegativity would be four minus 2.1, gives us a value of 1.9. 1.9 barely gets us in the 0.5 to below two value, right? And that means that we would expect it to be a polar bond. Are the electrons being shared just a little unequally or pretty unequally in this case? It's being shared pretty much not a lot unequally, right? A lot of it is going towards the fluorine there because of its high electronegativity. It's to the point where, remember, about two issues where we get a transfer of electrons, but in this case, it's still kind of hanging out. We look at lithium, which is one. Fluorine is four. So again, our change in electronegativity, four minus one is three. And three is above two, which means it is ionic. Now, it won't be perfect, the ionic one in a lot of cases, but you know, it could generally do that. Question on how to do that. So let's take a look at some, and you decide, let's do the bond between carbon and hydrogen. Let's do the bond between nitrogen and oxygen. Let's do the bond between sulfur and oxygen. Let's do, uh, let's do lithium. We'll do uh, lithium uh, chloride. And let's do... Uh, Let's do carbon and sulfur. 
All right, so using electric activity values, is it going to be polar, nonpolar, or ionic? Okay, let's take a look since we're kind of getting to the end here. So we'll start with the carbon hydrogen. So carbon's value there is uh, 2.5, I believe. Hydrogen is 2.1. So basically the difference in electronegativity would be subtracting those two and gives us a value of 0.4, which is the upper limit for nonpolar. That, that is actually why the upper limit is there because the carbon hydrogen bond is nonpolar. And that's pretty much all organic compounds like the heptane you're going to use today in lab. That is a nonpolar substance. Um, and that's why the cutoff is sort of there. If we look at uh, sulfur and oxygen, sulfur is uh, 2.5. Oxygen is uh, 3.5. And by the way, you just take the larger number minus the smaller. So you end up with a positive number. 2.5 gives us a difference of one. And one is above 0.4, but below two, which means we would expect this guy to be a polar bond. By the way, if I drew the arrow, which would the arrow point towards the sulfur or towards the oxygen? Arrow always points towards the more electronegative, so it should point towards the oxygen side in that case. Yeah. Question on that one? <laughs> yeah. So uh, zero to point four is nonpolar. Above point four, so basically point five to less than two is polar. And then not in all cases, but in most cases, anything above two is ionic. What's that? Zero to zero point four is nonpolar. 0.5 to below two is polar and above two is ionic in most cases. So zero to 0 0.4 nonpolar, 0 0.5 to less than two polar above two, typically ionic. Okay, let's take a look at carbon and sulfur. Carbon is, uh, actually no, let's go down to lithium here. Lithium is uh, one. Chlorine is three. So once again here, that is three minus one, which is two. And that is going to get us ionic. We did not really need that because again, it's a metal and on metal. So we know it's ionic. Nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen is uh, three. Oxygen is 3.5. So the difference in electronegativity, 3.5 minus three, which gives us 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is just barely polar with the arrow pointing towards the oxygen side as it is more electronegative. Lastly, carbon and sulfur. Carbon is 2.5. Sulfur is 2.5, which means the difference in electronegativity is 2.5 minus 2.5, which is zero. That means carbon sulfur is nonpolar equals sharing of electron. It demonstrates an important point that you can have two different elements that will share the electrons equally. If you look on the periodic table, carbon and sulfur, they are diagonal of each other. So one is further up, one is further to right, right? So they cancel out their changes. And so you can have that diagonal relationship. You also see it with like nitrogen, and chlorine as well. So because they're just slightly off of each other, you can possibly have two different elements that will actually share the electrons equally. Lastly here, you don't necessarily need the values in certain cases. If you look at nitrogen and oxygen, they are in the same row on the periodic table, which means oxygen is further to the right, which means it should be more electronegative and it should be a polar bond without even needing the numbers. If you look at the sulfur and oxygen, they're in the same group and oxygen is further up on the periodic table, which means it should be more electronegative and should yield a polar bond. So in a lot of cases, you could use just the general trend of electronegativity to help you determine if it's going to be polar, if they're in the same row or same group and they're further away from each other, going to most likely be a polar bond. You do not have to memorize these numbers. They would be provided. Any questions on that? Okay.